everything should be. Uh, I was trying to start at the very bottom of the hour because we only have the nine yeah. minute tape. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. 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 Y chromosomes, 
and this is basically the, the total chromosome pairs were given, and down the very corner there you can see, my corner will work, um, the XY pair, which is the sex chromosomes. Also, if you produce sperm or if you produce eggs, and a great way of dividing people up, if you have ovaries, you're a woman, if you make sperm, you're a guy. Or, of course, external genitalia. If you have a penis, you're a male, if you have a vagina, you're a woman. Basically, the moment you're born, most people, and doctors included, look at you and go, oh, it has a penis, it must be a boy. Or it has a vagina, it must be a woman. It's pretty simple. It's not that simple. Because there are exceptions. There are women with have, without penises and there are boys who have vaginas. So that's what we're going to basically talk about through all this is, is how we determine sex and the variances in that. So in my mind, biological sex is the only absolute sex. Is that your reproductive function determines your biological sex. Do you produce sperm and do you produce eggs? If you don't produce either one of those, you cannot have a biological sex, because obviously you can't reproduce. So the question is, is would that person who doesn't produce egg, who doesn't produce a sperm, still be a man or still be a male or a female? There is an intersex condition, several of which, that you don't have sperm or egg. So therefore, you are not male or female from a biological reproductive point of view. Biological sex cannot be changed. We talk a lot about transsexuals, and we hear a lot about transsexuals, but you can't change your sex, because if you were born with a testicle, you make sperm. If you were born with ovaries, you make eggs. And you can't put an ovary in a man, you can't put a testicle in a woman, and change the biological sex. You want to remove those things. So they're really, the, the term transsexual is actually kind of misnomer, because there's no way to transfer across sexual boundaries. You can only simply remove your sex and choose not to be a sex, but it doesn't make you the other sex. So people often confuse, you got a question? Um, it's transsexual and transgender. Is that used interchangeably? We'll get to that. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, I'm back around the gender identity right now. We're, we're working out to it. Okay. <laughs> um, so the question is, is sex and gender the same thing? And are sex and gender interchangeable? Um, they're not, because biological sex is, is the production of eggs and sperm, where gender identity is your sense of womanness or maleness or manliness or your virilization, your masculinity, your feminization, and all that. Um, so gender is really about who you are, not how you reproduce. And the two things can be interchangeable because, again, women who have a female gender identity could have a male sexuality, and we can get into that later. Um, and what I'm going to talk about soon is, is, is gender as a social construct because as a platform we're all born male and female, but our gender identity develops out of a lot of different things that come to us from magazines, or peer, or families, our friends. And we develop this binary between men and women. And we, as a society, we reinforce that. We want these huge divisions in people that basically say, men do these things, as in these magazines, and women do these things. So it makes a very clear cut who we're going to have sex with, who we're going to defend, who we're going to fight. That's what we want to know as a society. It makes it real easy. If you see someone who is androgynous, especially from a man's point of view, it's like, should I be attracted to that? Or should I go fight it? Should I go kill it? Should I go run over it? You know, it's very confusing to people who are sexist based when an androgynous person is with because we, we want to know. That's the first thing we want to know about someone is what their sex is. And if their gender identity doesn't match their sex, we get really put off because if it's an effeminate man, even, even a man dressing as a woman, if a man, a masculine man, is attracted to a feminine dressing man, that person can get very upset with that. So we, as a society, 98% of us like these rigid norms to make us feel comfortable. We like those markers. We get confused when markers change. So as I mentioned, gender identity, how you develop as a person, comes from a lot of things. Your parents, family, friends, and peers in society. We're constantly bombarded by messages to reinforce our gender identity. That you know, when you're born and the doctor sees a penis, they immediately put blue on you, and when they see a vagina, they put pink on you. Oddly enough, 200 years ago, it was exactly opposite of that. When you were born a girl, you were given blue clothes, and when you were a boy, you were given pink clothes. Why that changed, I don't know, but it's just kind of ironic that that's arbitrary, too. We just made that up. But that's the way it is. From day one, when you're born, you're basically start down that path of polarization. The society begins to build and build and build these gender identity icons and tells you what you should be, regardless of what you are. You know, the, the society has decided that we're going to program you to be one gender or another. And, and we choose that based on the presentation or genitalia. Mm -hmm. 
So you can change your gender expression. If you choose to wear a tie or a dress, that's your gender expression. However, your gender identity cannot be changed. That's a matter of brain wiring. It has nothing to do with your sexuality. It has to do with your brain wiring. That based upon genetics and hormones during the virilization or development process, your brain's wired more female or male, more male. We are all conceived template female. And hormones drive us more female or more male. If that process is ever interrupted, you get something in between. So what is transgender? To go back to your question. Basically, a transgender person challenges a gender binary. They basically say, you know, I don't believe that there's rigid stereotypes. I can wear a dress if I want to. I can wear a tie if I want to. I can wear a tie with a dress if I want to. As kooky as that might be, but transgender people basically try to break those boundaries of the gender binary. They may present this image part-time or full-time. Some people just cross-dress for fun. They go out at night to a bar. They hide in a hotel room wearing skirts. It's a fetish issue versus a gender expression issue. But either way, it's still breaking those gender boundaries, be it in private or in public. In my particular case, I'm certainly trying to you know, be the part of leaning a feminine 24-7, and that's what I'm doing right now. So, to a lot of people, the term transgender simply means a guy in a skirt. It's a very common thing to, to just be dismissive of transgender as just a guy who can work in a pink tutu. When I lobby in Nevada legislature against, or for, excuse me, um, gender identity issues in the workplace, this is the argument that comes up. That, oh, I don't want a guy showing up in a pink tutu. Well, that's kind of a, a misnomer because transgenderism is a much broader picture than that. And, and it makes a nice sound bite to call it a man in a pink tutu, but it's not. Gender issues are inherently innate to people. And the people who are transgender basically are trying to express who they are, overcoming societal boundaries to break out of those stereotypes. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, there are people who are cross-dressers 24 7 RuPaul's a great example. This is a classic, stereotypical cross-dresser. Basically, knows he's a man, but dresses as a woman, is a known cross-dresser, and enjoys looking like a woman, a Hollywood drag queen, if you will. Um, but this person knows it's his manliness. He takes the wig off, takes the dress off, and, and goes about being a gay man for the most part. Um, doesn't want to live 21st century as a woman, merely expresses a female gender in it from time to time. Again, a part-time gender bender, if you will. So transgender is a very broad term. It encompasses anything that has to do with breaking gender boundaries. You know, again, we're, we're born in pink and blue world, but transgender people dismiss the pink and blue world and have a, a lovely lavender world. A transsexual, though, is kind of an old term. And transsexual people go back and support the binary. Typically, the old school transsexual is someone who seeks surgery, wants to look 20% of the opposite sex, and spends an incredible amount of money and time transitioning from one stereotype to another stereotype. Really kind of ignores and dismisses any kind of sense of a gender boundary in between. Basically, I'm going to be a man, or I'm going to be a woman, and I'm going to spend money to get a penis or get a vagina and live in a role 24-7 and act like I never was a woman or a man. That's what transsexuals, in the common phrase, discusses typically. And you can consider transsexual a subset of transgenderism, or the term transgender. So going back to your question, a transgender person could be a cross-dresser, but a transsexual typically would refer to someone who's actually had surgery and wants to support permanently a stereotype of one or the other. Oh, thank you. So typical male to female transsexual, Donna Rose and Lynn Conway, I've actually met Donna Rose, she wrote a book which is a reference to the end of the presentation, and Lynn Conway is a pretty well-known electrical engineer. Both these people were born male, I use the term in quotes, and transitioned to relatively attractive women, um, and lived their life 24 seven as women, supporting the stereotype, and make no bones about themselves being women. They will actually come up and say, I am a woman. I had a vagina installed, and now I'm a woman. Mm -hmm. Chromosomally, they're probably still man, unless they had genetic testing to prove otherwise. Female to male transsexuals, same thing. You give a, a woman a lot of testosterone, you get facial hair and baldness. It's not very attractive, but to people who want to become men, um, this is what happens. And I've had conversations with both these people. Jameson Green wrote a very good book on the nature of male or female to male transitioning, and Diego Sanchez works for um, Senator, um, oh, I forgot, Barney Frank's office up in Washington, D.C. Thank you. So, going back to what I said earlier, have transsexuals really changed their sex? No, they haven't. They are, they are, they are 
24-7 transgender people. You cannot change your sex. This is really an outdated term. This goes back to 10, 20, 30 years ago when we couldn't define what sex was. And going back to what I said earlier, because sex can be defined in various ways, between sperm and genetics and everything else, and as we've seen recently, that the term sex is becoming more and more difficult to define because of what we'll get into later, and gender has become the preferred term, that someone has a gender, and I have a gender, I have a, I have a feminine leaning gender in me, and I could talk higher if you want me to, but I'm not going to. <laughs> and I also curtsy very nice. <laughs> if that reinforces the stereotype for you. So going on from that, we have the, the, the intersex community, which a lot of people don't know anything about. And this typically involves indeterminate genitalia at birth, um, chromosomal defects, or a mixture of those. And also can have a, as a result of hormonal difficulties. There's lots of reasons why intersex people exist, and we'll get into many of those later in the presentation. One of the most common examples is AIS, or androgen and sensitivity syndrome. This is basically when an XY male is born and develops in the womb, but has a genetic defect that makes them completely immune to the ravages of testosterone. So this person could have been a perfectly normal male, but because of, during the development, all the testosterone that she made went nowhere, she never realized. So she has a vaginal pouch, no ovaries, no uterus, and will never have body hair, and I wish I was her. <laughs> <laughs> well, Charles just hurts. Um, so, and she actually was on Oprah and trying to bring some attention to AS. It's one of the more common um, genetic errors that cause intersex conditions. She was born with a shallow vagina and was basically thought to be a woman until she didn't have a period. And basically around 16, they did a genetic test and found out she did in fact have XY chromosomes and was a male <coughs> from a genetic point of view. But since she has no ovaries and no uterus, she can't deliver a baby, so she's not a woman. So we've got two questions here over here. Um, how, like, what percentage of the population is, is born intersex? So I know it's going up, too, but... Well, and we'll get into the reasons why. Okay, well, cool, yes. Um, the, the general number thrown out is 1%, because when you say transgender, it can be anything from a person who has a slightly feminine behaving mentality, or dresses effeminately, or ha questions their masculinity, or in the case of a woman, questions their femininity, or someone who seeks um, SRS or, or surgery, or someone who has an endocrine issue or a genetic issue. So when you say transgender or how many people are there, even in the course of intersex, do you mean genitally you know, intersex or chromosomally intersex or you know, whatever? So it's a very broad issue, but the rough numbers between 1 to 2% of the population have some measure of ambiguous genitalia, gender identity issue, or chromosomal anomalies. Yeah? But she wouldn't be able to develop breasts then? We'll get into that. Okay. Is she in clitoris? Yeah, she has a clitoris. I didn't check her specifically. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that she does. I can't confirm that. Yeah. Um, there was someone in the sports news. Coming up. Oh, okay. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> right, you're all like. I, I got it all figured out. I've been studying this for ten years. <laughs> um. So anyway, um, I will get into the, the breast question. Um, so there was actually a film produced in 2007 called XXY. Um, this actually talks about Klinefelter syndrome, which is not AIS, obviously. But most people have either an XY chromosome pair or an XX chromosome pair. There are actually people who are born with an extra sex chromosome, and that gives them extra genetic material. And depending upon gene expression, they can express themselves in various ways. There's no way to call this particular gene known as to what the person might be, because during development, those genes will express themselves the way they choose to, much like when children have blonde hair or blue eyes or mm -hmm. brown hair. Doesn't really, you, you don't know what the genetic mix is going to make until it comes out. And in the case of an XXY person, brain development, everything, is, is basically a crapshoot because there's so much genetic material there, they can be anything, even in between. And most of these people have, are born with ambiguous genetic, and most of them develop um, schizophrenia later in life because mm -hmm. all that confusion going on in the brain. The brain's not built correctly to be very masculine, very female, and you can actually develop all kinds of developmental disorders based upon having all that confusing genetic material available to be used to build this person. They're almost a unique individual, not male, not female. They're one of a kind knockoffs, if you will. Mm -hmm. yeah. There are also other kinds, from XX to XO, and also mosaics are possible, where you have a combination of like Klein filters and normal genes. 
and we'll get into some other things in that as well as that goes too. So there's about 16 different known combinations of sex chromosomes, not just XX and XY, going back one to 2% human people. Most people don't even know it. They may be just labeled infertile. They never get karyotyped to find out exactly what's wrong with them. They just go adopt somebody and they can go about their day. But a lot of them have chromosome anomalies that tie directly back to the sex chromosome, either having extra chromosomes, defective chromosomes, or gene errors. This is a really important chart. Um, let's see if I can get my pointer to work. This is a new point upon. Let's see. There it is. Um, this is secondary sex characteristics and this is sexual behavior. So basically, when you come out of womb, this is what you're looking at. Do you have a penis or a vagina or a mixture of both? Do you have a too short a penis, too deep a vagina? Um, and then this is your behavior. So both of these things are basically like a row of dominoes. And at any one of these points, a domino can fall out of the sequence so that you're left basically template female because we're all born template female. And as we go down the row of dominoes and they start falling, your brain gets wired to your behavior, your gender identity, and your second, your sex characteristics, you know, um, facial hair, length of your penis, depth of vagina, all that come out of here in your external genitalia and your sex characteristics. So these are two distinct things. And unfortunately, when we see someone who has ambiguous genitalia, we fix this part, or at least we think we fix this part. But the same things that cause this to be androgynous or ambiguous made this part ambiguous and androgynous. And just because you go in and cut this up doesn't mean you've done anything over here. And you can't go in someone's brain and cut out the male or cut out the female parts. Whereas we think in of course of genitalia, we can do that. Mm. If you're a male, more than likely you have this as your sex chromosome. And on that chromosome pair, there are millions of genes. And a defect in any one of those genes can lead to various anomalies, everything from missing your penis, to having too small a penis, to having ovaries that are oviotestes, you name it. If it's on the XY, it's going to affect your sex. So there are basically several genes on a chromosome pair that cause these things to happen. The SRY gene is probably the biggest one. It, but it's actually used in Olympic Games to determine if you're a man or a woman. But even that has come up with some scrutiny. But um, defects in the SY, SRY gene or defects in expression can cause sex reversal, things of that nature. Um, low sperm counts or infertility. So if you're interested in just looking at genes, you can go through and research how these genes work and how the systems all work to build these various structures. But there are specific genes that have identified the defects in those genes. If you have a karyotype and you have genetic analysis done and you have a defective SRY and you're infertile, there's a reason. Um, DAX1 also leads to normal testes formation. Um, lack of a DAX1 gene can lead to sex reversal. Now when they say sex reversal, all that means is that the external genitalia don't match the sex chromosome. It's not really a reversal, it's really a non-get there. <laughs> Um, because everybody's born template female for the most part. And if you don't produce enough testosterone, you won't get to maleness. You will get to somewhat virilized femaleness or somewhere in between. SOX9 also, um, the anti Miller induct or Miller induct tissue is basically leftover female parts in a male. And if, if the SOX9 is affected, you could have fallopian tubes, um, part of an ovary, part of the uterus. All that stuff's supposed to go away during the development process as a male because you were all born with the seeds. We all have all of those seeds. Um, if there's any kind of a increase in estrogen during development, those tissues can still be there. I had an uh, ultrasound done looking for some molar duct tissue, but I think she looked in the wrong place. She was, she was looking where a vagina normally should be, but I've actually got MRIs of a 72-year-old man. He went in and complained about um, abdominal pains. They found a uterus over here. Happens. Um, another two, two more genes. And these are actually, I believe this is a pair. Yeah, it's, it's present on both the X and Y chromosome. And if you're missing the DR, DR, DMRT1 and 2 as a pair, you can have all kinds of problems. So there actually is a linkage where you need to mate on both chromosomes to make this work right. And again, it leads to um, feminization. Um, also, it may lead to true hermaphroditism. 
And again, this comes up when you have extra chromosomes, especially in the case of XXYs, where the building blocks to build both are there, because in the case of XXs, for the most part, you only get female. When you have XX and a Y, you actually have essentially enough material there to build two people. So when they say a true hermaphrodite, that's typically because of chromosomal error, where there was enough material to build a uterus, ovaries, a penis, testicles, and it's almost like two people living inside of each other in that sense. But again, it's just a matter of all that genetic material can express itself if it wants to, based upon a thousand to one shot of where the genes were when the baby was conceived. So that's basically a rundown of genetic variances. Um, we're going to talk about um, actual displaying of what happens when you have genetic defects. So we basically understand the root of fundamentals. We have genes, we have chromosomes, we can have defects in those, and various pairings of sex chromosomes, XOs, XXYs, things like that. These are actually defects on the chromosomes that actually have disease names, you know, like congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Um, but these are actually situations where people have got genetic defects. And these are people, it sounds great, a nice disease and all that, but these are people who have nothing wrong with them except they've had a problem that has resulted in some kind of biggest genitalia. Um, in CAH, you're conceived as a 46XX female. So basically, in the womb, they would go, oh, you're not gonna have a girl, if you did genetic testing through amniocentesis. Um, unfortunately, because of genetic defect, the female releases a steroid home hormone. So if you wanna be an athletic woman and be bulked up, have CAH, because you get an extra steroid hormone. And what that does, it basically, a woman will self-virilize. She, she produces extra androgens that result in a masculinized genitalia. So this person's clitoris became a, basically looks like a penis, and her vag vagina closed up because she was exposed to a self-produced androgen because of a genetic defect. But she has female chromosomes. But coming out of the womb, if you didn't know otherwise, you would look at this baby and go, it's a boy! Mm -hmm. A very infertile boy mm -hmm. that might have an internal ovary or two because all, all the testosterone does is virilize external genitalia. There actually might be a uterus and ovaries in place here as well because this is just a clitoral structure that's been virilized. It's nothing to do with internal structures. Um, and 5-alpha reductase deficiency, um, this is an interesting one. Basically, a, a 46XY male was born with the inability to produce DHT, which is dihydrotestosterone. So basically, the person doesn't go through the virilization process in the womb. So they come out, they look female. Again, very shallow vagina, hasn't been virilized. And it's like, congratulations, it's a girl. When they hit puberty, their, testos their, their testicles do produce regular testosterone, and they begin to virilize at 12 years old. So the clitoris gets long, they grow facial hair, they start bulking up, and all of a sudden their mother realizes that they really had an under-virilized baby boy mm. that later on became a boy. And this happens in the case of 190 in the Dominican Republic, I guess because of all the inbreeding, it's become more common there. And they've actually developed social structures to deal with it. They expect at 12 that you may be changing your sex and your name because you find out you're actually a boy. So they tend to do genetic testing a lot more down there in these cases. But in that island, it's not uncommon to be a transgender person because one in nine boys or girls become boys. It's pretty common. So again, it's, it's just interesting how we as a society in Western culture um, if we just got out of our box, we understand that in other uh, cultures, they are much more used to it because it naturally occurs because of genetic defect and because of the nature of the inbreeding of the island, they're having more and more of it and they become actually used to it. Um, Swire syndrome, basically, um, you're a 46 XY male, but you have no gonads. They're just basically streaks. So you produce no testosterone, you don't virilize, you don't become masculine. You're kind of like an AIS male in the fact that you have no effects of testosterone.